grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, like a liturgical alarm clock, the last day of the church year has come. And it awakens us out of our stupor and really out of our sleep of sin. Our Lord says, Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so this alarm, it is sounding right now in your church, in your very ears. Awaken, for it is time to throw off the deeds of darkness, to repent of our sin and our sloth, and to lay aside the concerns of this world that are overgrown and that threaten to choke out our faith. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, our gospel lesson that we just heard takes place during Holy Week. The context is Jesus speaking of the need to be watchful, being ready for his return. He has promised it, and it is going to happen, and he wants us ready. And so to illustrate this, Jesus tells this parable of the ten virgins, which really is the capstone of his teaching. For the main character, the bridegroom, he finally appears. Well, the image is as charming as it is earnest. There are ten girls, and just permit me to make them 14-year-olds. They're on the way, every last one of them, to a wedding ceremony. They are presumably tickled pink to the point of teenage giddiness at their happy prospects. Because since receiving the invitation to be bridesmaids, they expect nothing but tea and cake from here on out. The wedding and subsequent festivities would be held at the home of the bride. Prior to this, the bridegroom and the bride would be betrothed, just as Joseph and Mary were betrothed to one another when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. During the betrothal, the bridegroom, after a deal is met and uh, dowries are exchanged, the bridegroom would then go back to his father's house and build on to it, making preparations for his future wife and his future family. They didn't, didn't have apartments. And the bridegroom would say, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am you may be also. Does that sound familiar? So upon completion, the bridegroom was then expected to show up at the wedding. But the exact time was unknown. Yet once his entourage came, the bridegrooms would thereby join in and make their way into the party. So the bride maids, they've all arrived. Girl talk and giggles go on through the day and into the evening. Lamps are lit. The chatter continues. Finally, though, the wedding feast, it turns into a slumber party. For all ten begin to get drowsy, their heads nod, and eventually they sack out. Now, first century lamps were small. You've probably seen them. They're saucer-like uh, saucer-shaped vessels with a, a cover that, well, with a, a spout that was nothing more than the wick. You could easily hold one in your hand. They weren't made to contain enough oil to burn all night long. That's why the wise, they bring an extra flask of oil with them. Well, as everyone snoozes, someone sees the approaching company coming off in the distance and the cry is made. You heard it. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And everybody jumps up. Things are gathered. Wicks are trimmed in order that they might be burning with full brightness. Now, something to keep in mind is that in the ancient Jewish culture, the emphasis was not placed upon the bride 
like it is in our own. The emphasis was always on the bridegroom. He's here. Here he is. But not everybody's ready. Five of the girls, as our text says, foolish ones, or actually it's the word from moron, the five foolish ones, they discover that their oil has run out. All they have are these mere glimmerings of dry wicks. However, the wise girls, the ones who insisted to bring extra oil, are asked to share what they have. And this is met with a cold reception. There won't be enough for us if we give some to you. Which is true. If this request is granted, there was the danger all would lack enough and be refused admission into the party, and they're not going to risk that. So the wise girls tell the foolish girls to go get more oil for it cannot be shared. And while they do, the bridegroom arrives. Those who were prepared go in with him and of course the door is shut. Sometimes later the others come back and of course they're knocking, Lord, Lord, open to us. The bridegroom answers, truly I say to you, I don't know you. Jesus concludes by saying, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Beloved, the point is not about the importance of sharing. That is not what Jesus is teaching. The point is the end will come suddenly. The final judgment and the second coming of Christ, it's going to happen. Some are going to be prepared and others will not be prepared. Some will go into the party and others will not. Some go to heaven and others do not. There comes a time when it's even too late to believe. The gospel will no longer be preached. The oil will not be shared, and the door is shut. And when you hear that, what do so many of us think? When we hear that, what do we, what do we even think about? We think something like, what's for lunch today? Or, who's playing? Leftovers again? And folks, that's our sin. To doubt that what God has in store for us in heaven is somehow or another actually better than this life. Or that what we have here, what we have here in the fun that we have, compared to the joys in heaven that await us. It's hard to believe that if we're called home or the bridegroom returns while we're alive, that somehow or another we're going to miss out on something better that's going on here. Church, the end is coming. We are dying. And these and this is just indicative of the fact that we're dying. All of us. Moreover, all the signs that our Lord predicted about the end, they have already come to pass. The apostasy started when the Lord's disciple failed him during his passion. The earthquake and the signs in heaven, they happened at our Lord's crucifixion. And since that time, the signs have only escalated like a woman with labor pains, which grow more and more intense and become more and more frequent as the time gets closer. We are in the tribulation. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, we are in the last days. Now what makes the difference is the oil. The supply of oil allows the wise to enter into the party with the bridegroom and the absence of the oil keeps the morons, the foolish, locked out, missing out on what they expected to be in on. Oil in this parable is faith. 
and those things that go along with it, namely trust in Christ alone, hope in good things from a good God, repentance, love, ensuing good works, etc. Everyone who has the oil of faith will be welcomed into the wedding, for it is only faith or unfaith that matters. So the question becomes, how do we get this precious oil? Well, I'm glad you asked. It is created in you by holy baptism. When the Spirit of God took up residence in you. Actually, at a baptismal ceremony, it is announced that the baptized are actually in the company of the wise virgins in today's parable. It's on page 271 of your hymnal. It's right in the middle of the page, and this is what it says. And I think I've got one here. I found this about back, so I assume you use baptismal candles when somebody is baptized. So the pastor takes the baptismal candle, he lights it from the paschal candle, he gives it to the mother or the father, if it's a child or if it's an adult, we give it to the baptized. We say this, receive this burning light to show that you have received Christ who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which shall have no end. It's like we're saying, you be one of the five wise and not the five foolish. The Lord Jesus sent his Holy Spirit into this world to work through holy baptism. And he did it as well to work through the preached word and through the sacrament of the altar to distribute forgiveness which instigates and it builds faith. Gang, where the Holy Spirit dwells, He gives faith. And where there is faith, there is good works. Faith is the root. Good works are the fruit. Both the wise and the foolish, they know this. But here's the difference. The foolish don't believe it. They don't think they need it. Lamps that were once filled with oil, bright with the light of faith, they grew empty, dark, and cold. However, the wise know that they need this continual supply of these gifts of God. The dealers, the dealers of this holy commodity, well, they're the Christian church and the ministers who are entrusted with the mysteries. This is where oil is received in this life and it continues to fill you up by daily contrition, repentance, and absolution. The oil in your vessel overflows when you partake of the cup of the Lord, drinking His blood and eating His body in His sacrament. When the call goes out by the holy angels of God, when your last hour comes, you can meet your bridegroom. And you can do so in all confidence because He has not destined you for wrath but for salvation through your Lord Jesus Christ who died for you so that whether you are awake or asleep, you might live with Him. Folks, the Bible begins with a marriage where our first parents, Adam and Eve, where they were united in holy matrimony. At the end of the Bible, God in Jesus Christ unites himself with his people, with the church, which is, was in the hymn that we just sang and in the book of Revelation. There is a separation between Babylon, which is this evil fallen world system, and Zion, which is the church. And at the end of the Bible, God in Jesus Christ unites himself with his people, with holy Zion, with his church, just as the bridegroom to the bride. And there's a party, one we don't want to miss. And so we wait for the reappearing of our hidden bridegroom who has promised us, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. At where I am, you may be also. The same bridegroom who came and embraced us on the cross 
laying down his life for ours has not left us on our own. Oh no. He is with us to keep our lamps filled with the oil of faith, especially in these gray and latter days, that when he appears, we won't be surprised. So how do we do it? How do we keep watch? Well, we wait for the one who is coming by watching the one who has come. We look not for the bridegroom in the clouds, but we look in the manger, the babe who lies there. And we look upon the cross, fixing our eyes on Jesus where he's present, but hidden for us now. Again, this is in the preaching of the word. This is in the proclamation of his forgiveness. It's in the washing of baptism, and it is in the eating of his supper. And when the bridegroom appears, and he is no longer hidden, you will see him, and you will be ready. You will trim your lamps with the oil of faith that he has given you and kept nourished and supplied all of these years. And you will go in the wedding banquet of heaven that he has prepared for you. For you have been watching by faith all along. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Stand together.